When I first conceptualized the cross-generation runs that I do, the idea was it was simple. Let's see what Pokemon from future generations can actually rival Mewtwo's dominance in Generation 1. But the, the real problem here, guys, is that I hadn't actually optimized Mewtwo yet. Since we last saw Mewtwo, a year has passed, and every single cross-gen run I've done has been faster than that old time. And even a few vanilla Gen 1 runs have passed it, and quite frankly, I'm tired of it. Today, it's time to put some respect on Mewtwo's name. And we can see how high it climbs up. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do Pokemon solo runs mainly focused on generation 1 and 2 and I rank them after several runs with some optimizations. Now if you would like to know the rules I use you can check out the description and whether you are a new viewer or a returning subscriber like speedrunner0218 sit back relax grab yourself a soda pop and just know that I really do appreciate the support. For the uninitiated, there's two key factors that make Mewtwo the king of Gen 1, and it's on display right here in the first rival battle. Just like its legendary counterpart Articuno, it starts off with the strongest move of its type, and Psychic is going to start to put in work early and often for the run. To feed into Psychic, Mewtwo stats, they're bonkers, and it has a massive 154 special. It's still one of the highest in the game today if you're not counting like Megas or things of that nature. And if you look down, if you were wondering how good is 130 speed, all you need to know is that it provides over a 25% chance to crit. So not only are we going to be doing tons of damage, but statistically, one out of four hits, they're going to obliterate anything. And I think the picture of how dominant this genetic freak is already kind of coming into play. So we take all those ingredients, we add in a TM learn set that's only outclassed by Mew, we pour in one cup of the pot for the fact that psychic types essentially have no weaknesses in Gen 1, and you just kind of have the basis of a run that just can't really be matched by any other Pokemon if you play it right. What this run really revolves around is the move Psychic. You have 10 uses of it and you need to sparingly use it to solve problems until you heal again, but Mewtwo's power point pool is really massive at the start of the game and one of its greatest strengths and what I've came to gain a lot of respect for over the course of a couple of runs and I'm even just going to go ahead and say it was the MVP of the run. It was Confusion, this little move Confusion. It puts in so much work, it fills in all the gaps. It just keeps Mewtwo going like a well-oiled machine. Now we've talked a little bit already. As for the gameplay, the start of the game, very simple, minimum battles. Now we're already going to see in this first mandatory bug catcher, we have to use Psychic because Confusion just can't really get it done. Psychic's going to speed this up just a little bit and that's all there really is to say. We can just kind of skip ahead. We can look at Brock before we talk more about Mewtwo. rock solid Pokemon's trainer. They're really defensive and they can be a nightmare for tons of Pokemon with only resisted normal moves, but we're Mewtwo. And I'm pretty sure you know how this one's going to be. Note that our low level means that these are not going to be one shots. And I'm choosing to go straight Psychic here, meaning that it's going to cost us four more uses of Psychic. Now you could argue that you could maybe go for a confusion on the Geodude after the first Psychic and it could have worked, but even then it's not a guaranteed. So I just feel like it's better to be safe than sorry this early, but it's a clean battle. We wrap it up. Not much more to say about it. We can talk about some more things about Mewtwo. Now remember back in that Alolan Ninetales run, I did an extra early battle to level up so we could put Brock's Pokemon into a more favorable ranges. Mewtwo doesn't really have this luxury and that's really it's going to lead us to the one singular downside of this monster and it's the horrible slow leveling group i hate it a bad learn set is something that's really common in some of the worst runs but the the one thing that really puts a lot of pokemon low on the tier list is this slow leveling group something like rhyhorn it got a very low score and the slow leveling group it was a key contributor to that but as we progress i want to set up this narrative that mewtwo is fighting against the worst leveling group in the entire game every step of the way so everything it does, everything that looks impressive, remember slow leveling group, worse than the game. And what it really comes down to, it just means that early training before Brock, it just does not provide the same payout and time saves that it does on something like Alolan Ninetales that was in the medium fast group. Now let's look at Mount Moon and we're flipping over to some different footage and I'm going to set, let me set this up for you guys. You see Zubats, they're weak to psychic damage and since you're in the slow leveling group, I'm getting encounters anyway. The original thought process was, hey, confusion one shots, it's about the same time as running away. So I could use this little bit of experience. Maybe we could push another level earlier. And I think, and I still 
still think right now that it sounds like a solid idea when you say it out loud. Now guys, Psychic, it has virtually no weaknesses due to the virtue of a coding bug making it immune to ghosts and the fact that bug moves are all but non-existent in this game. But we're about to see the most miraculous series of events in Mount Moon. Get Strap in for this one. I get into an encounter with a Zubat. I Gen 1 miss. 1 out of 256 chance by the way. And then it hits the 55% accurate supersonic. So I think you, you can tell where this is going to head. Then I hurt myself. 50-50 chance. And then I take a super effective leech life. Doesn't do a ton. It's not really a big deal, right? So once again, I hurt myself. And guys, this level 11 Mount Moon Wild Zubat takes down Mewtwo. And at this point, I just kind of stood here in disbelief. Like, what did I just see? How did this just happen? I really wanted to show this clip. Remember, it's uh, different footage, not the run that we're actually watching. But it was just so unlikely to happen. I would say it's even less likely than maybe like going into the champion fight, losing a speed tie, the opponent choosing Psychic, and it critting to cost you a race in front of like 50,000 people. But I guess, hey, it happens, right? Needless to say, I cut this idea out and I don't want to think about it anymore. I don't want anybody to bring it up. So this never happened. I don't even know why I'm showing it. Let's cut back to the real run. Keep in mind here that we're only level 13 and I think only Mewtwo could make it feel like you aren't actually weak or under leveled. In my original video a long time ago, I really wanted to fight Misty first and the logic at the time is that Bubble Beam would help speed up Nugget Bridge, but that's not really the case at all. Fighting level 20 plus tanky special Pokemon at level 13, it's not great, it's not consistent, but I think we should just hop into rival number two and go over something obvious that I personally didn't pick up on. Now we got Pidgeotto, we know about Sand Attack, but here I just crit. We got that nice beefy 25% chance, that means no Sand Attacks, and essentially at this point the battle's already going to be over, but for one second I want to gush about Confusion. Now with such high special and a move with 75 effective power, I really gained a lot of respect for this move in the run, and I'm going to use it way deeper into the game than you actually would think. I'll come back to Misty and Bubble Beam, we'll talk about that later, but I often talk about Nugget Bridge. Now guys, tell me if you heard this one before, but Nugget Bridge, it contains the single most dense cluster of mandatory battles, and you want this part of the game to be as fast as you possibly can make it, and fortunately for this run, Mewtwo, he's already equipped to do so, we don't have to do anything extra. And you might, I'll, I'll bring this up real quick, you might notice that my game looks a little bit different if you're new here, the version, it, it's this is mechanically the same as red and blue under the hood, think of this as like a skin. I'm I'm using the yellow Game Boy Color palette with sprites from the Space World 1997 demo and I also have increased back sprite sizes. I just wanted to clarify that, bring it up if somebody's watching this and they're like, what's going on? And if that's not enough, think about it like a League of Legends skin for a champion if it wasn't already clear. After Bill, it is time for Misty and Staryu is not a Psychic type yet, so one Psychic, all we need, get it out of here. As for Starmie, Psychic is actually the move that you want to go despite it being resisted. You may not think that, it's not really intuitive and it gets even better when you start to consider that 33% special drop chance which I get on the first turn and I just want to say that Starmie is not a pushover Pokemon it has really great stats and taking this thing out with ease with resisted damage it almost feels wrong After the battle we get Bubble Beam, and I really want to talk about Bubble Beam just a little bit more. It's 60 base power, it uses our special, and it gives us some coverage outside of just psychic damage. Now the thing is, we don't need coverage right now. Everything Bubble Beam can do, psychic or confusion, it can do it just as good or better. Cutting this move out, reducing move pool bloat, saving time in the menus, where you would have to find it, select it, and learn the move, it was a big optimization and it's really worth pointing out. It feels very natural and easy just to go ahead and learn this move because we still have disable on our learn set but at this point I hope you guys just trust in the process by now but if you're doubting me if you're wondering why I'm not wait until the end we'll see the results it's gonna be worth it down in the SSN the first order of business is to pick up body slam it has one primary function in the run like we've seen in the Gengar or the Alakazam run and we'll go into it in detail later but for now just know that I do not need to learn it just yet the next thing is the gentleman candy and runs like a Lola Nantels or something like that really top tier runs the better leveling group it dictated that I could actually skip stuff like that trim some time off but Mewtwo's slow leveling group means that I will need this and I have no choice but to go in here do an optional battle and grab it for later use and this is going to take us to rival number three and we were a mere level 13 last time
time we fought the rival and with eight more levels with the legendary stats that we have I think you already know how this one's gonna be I have tons of psychic left I can get those ranges on pretty much anything I want and the only thing to really foreshadow here is Kadabra now notice how swift isn't good enough for a guaranteed one shot I don't get the range here and you might be wondering if I should have already just taught body slam to save some time but when you consider that you'd have to menu a little bit learn the move it would just be slower than actually just selecting swift for a second time and I'll just come out and say it I was obsessed with this run and I really wanted to achieve like a really dominant time and every second counted as for surge I'm not playing any games today I'm blasting everybody with psychic you get a psychic everybody's getting a psychic but this one's it's not really clean at the very end psychic it can't one shot the Raichu without a crit so I do get hit with a thunderbolt of course it paralyzes me this lets the Raichu go again waste some more time and at the end of the day it's still pretty fast I'm not really gonna stress about some like minor turn losses here and there but that's pretty much Surge. Afterwards, when I get the back voucher from Mr. Rapidash, this is the time I decide to learn some moves. I held off on Body Slam because I knew that I would need to menu here anyway, and combining the acts of like learning Thunderbolt, then learning Body Slam, and then going to the party screen to dig out, it just felt really efficient. It feels nice to me. And what you're seeing here, this learn set, you're gonna see this for pretty much the most part of the game. It gives you pretty much everything you need. Things like the Q-Bones inside of Rock Tunnel, you would think Bubble Beam would be really good, but they just fall to a psychic just to same. Thunderbolt can take out things like the Slowpoke. And I guess Body Slam here was just mainly taught because I was already learning Thunderbolt anyway, but just like I said earlier, we will go into detail about Body Slam later in the run. Now even when you get to the Self-Destruct Hiker, you can see Confusion, just Confusion is putting in work. Bubble Beam's double super effective damage, it's beyond overkill, you don't need it. And this is a prime example of just why you could just take that move and just cut it out of the run and just save yourself a little time. Skipping ahead to the Rocket Hideout, there's not too much to say here. As as usual we are picking up high money items to sell and even though this place is easy the ultimate goal is to leave this with at least like a handful of psychics and that's going to set us up for the next part of the game without having to heal or use an elixir and you can see here at the end i just dig out i almost heal on instinct but i do catch myself and i immediately i start to book it down to erica's gym and poison being weak to psychic you can kind of guess why i wanted to manage my power points here now going into erica's gym i want to talk about something and it's why do i battle this cool trainer here more often often than not in my runs. And even in like the sweaty Scott's Thoughts races, you might see me do this in my runs. Now a term I hear these days is not only minimum battles, but minimum Pokemon. And the execute beauty is theoretically the fastest route since it's only one Pokemon compared to three. Now the problem for me personally in most runs is that you usually can't one shot it and the likelihood of it using like hypnosis, putting you to sleep, it just has the random potential to cost like three times the amount that it would just to do this battle and do like three quick one shots in three turns. I don't think I've mentioned that much and I just finally just wanted to bring it up. When I think through some of the battles like the Dig Rocket Grunt with a Drowsy and the Execute Beauty, those are two specific battles that can just really get out of hand if you're just not equipped for them or if you don't think about them much. They have a lot of time wasting potential. Now we're on to Erica, and there's a reason I'm here early. Psychic, it does disgusting damage, and it's just an easy one shot on both the Victory Bell and the Vile Plume. Now, taking this out now, it gives me extra money, it gives me Mega Drain so I can sell it for a better Celadon buy. And this one is really clean, except that I don't one shot the Tangela because it's a dirty little time wasting goon that's never gonna get its own video. Stop asking for it. No Tangela. For the run shot by, I keep it simple. I do five calciums and I do it without wasting any time. Uh, we don't buy, we don't get any extra TMs at the top so we can just get in and get out. Now later I'm gonna talk about this more but I really threw around and messed around with the idea that you could get proteins here instead and we'll go into that later. It's gonna come into play like with body slam but let's just say it didn't work out in terms of time saving. Calciums, they're the way to go. Now we can start to kind of rapid fire a few segments and we'll start right here in Pokemon Tower. There's no need to be PP conscious. There's a free heal coming up, but the only thing that's really kind of interesting is that you don't need Ice Beam for this run. It's a waste of time. You can simply just one shot the Execute with a resisted Psychic. And I just find that interesting since most runs slow down for this Pokemon. Confusion's for the Ghastly. It also means that we don't have to look any further. And instead, let's head south to Fuchsia. And the Safari Zone Mewtwo doesn't have any use for things like Carbos or Vitamin so we can cut those out and outside of the full restore I'm just doing standard things I'm picking up the HMs and when we are done with that I'm gonna head towards Koga because of the superior top matchup it just makes the most sense now this is gonna lead into me talking about the second weakness maybe some runs like this or Alakazam have and it's other psychic types 
You were going to see this battle here not be perfectly clean, not really be specifically fast, and this is just kind of like the beginning of the handful of psychic type battles we're going to see as we transition into that late game. Going back to that earlier shopping, I tried to use candies here on some runs, I tried to use some proteins, it can put this and some future psychic mirror matches into one shots, but the cost of that was late game speed, and at the end of the day I'm just not willing to cut that. Overall in these two battles you can see the great equalizer is crit, and we have that impressive 25% chance to crit. It just makes it not as bad, but when it's at its worst is the final Hypno right here. You can see that this takes three hits to take out, which feels really slow in comparison to the rest of the game so far. But without spending resources, you kind of just have to grit your teeth, just take it, and just get through parts like this. With the talk about enemy psychic types out of the way, I think we know how Uncle Koga's gonna go. Now, if you wanna know how much respect or fear I have for Koga, just look at me. I'm half health and I'm poison, and I just don't care. It's really quick, really easy, it's really predictable. We're done here. Now it's time to head over to Sylphco and to make this run competitive with the very top runs like the Alolan Raichus or the Alolan Ninetales of the world, I would love to cut out the 10th floor optionals, but we've talked about the slow leveling group and it's just not in the cards today. The reality is that it really doesn't take a ton of time and it takes even less when you take into account you only have to blast a single Machoke to get to the candy here. And I really, I gotta say this here, I really wish Mewtwo got Earthquake. It learns practically everything else you could ever want and that 15 base damage increase over Body Slam, it just kind of tighten up some of the sloppy parts of this run but sitting here talking about what I wish I had what, what I wish a Pokemon could do it doesn't really help anything now overall we're doing the bare minimum and I think that's gonna lead us into rival number five For the Pidgeot, we have Thunderbolt, we can give this bird a quick and merciful death. And as for Growlithe, just avert your eyes, we can blame the rival for sending out a little bitty dog against a god. As for Execute, I'd like to talk about this for a second. We don't have Ice Beam, but this is, out of the whole game so far, this is the sole area where it would be useful, and I'm not going to be adding time to the playthrough just to make this one little insignificant bundle of eggs a little bit faster. Two Psychics can just do the job, and it's just not worth worrying about in my opinion. We're going to upgrade later when it's actually relevant. Next we have another psychic type, but remember Alakazam is frail. Now the key thing coming up is that we need Body Slam to do over half of its health. You can see that we're covered, and as far as Alakazam goes offensively, it poses no threat. But this is just an appetizer, we're not done with psychic types just yet. At the end is Blastoise, and the truth is that no starter is going to be a good choice against Mewtwo. Venusaur and Charizard, they're much more frail, and it would put a Gyarados on the rivals team. It's just sitting there begging me to do a Thunderbolt to it. And you can see even at this stage in the game, the bulk of Blastoise, it can survive a super effective hit, so I don't think there's too much argument for a harder champion team than the Squirtle team. And rather than go to Sabrina, I think it's a better use of time just to take a nice, relaxing, brisk swim down to Cinnabar first. Now this lets us do two things. The first is that we can pick up Blizzard, it's going to be a secret tool that we can use for later. And the second is that it lets us really take a contemplative look at ourselves and ask if TM28 really and truly is Doomstoner, brother, or not before we get to the gym fight. The beginning of the fight, it's a couple of one shots. Uh, no surprise here. And on the Rapid Ash, I get a crit. We just keep this breakneck pace going. And at the end of the fight, Arcanine outlevels us by a pretty big margin. So it does take several turns to whittle it down. But the experience going into the seventh badge, it was just worth it. And it's going to make the next part of the game flow just a little smoother. So we've talked about psychic types a good bit, and we only have the psychic gym left before we can fight Giovanni. Now this fight isn't difficult, but if you've watched a lot of Gen 1 playthroughs, you kind of know what's going to make this fight annoying, but in case you don't, I would rather just kind of jump in and show you guys the footage. The first of the battle doesn't matter much. We start off with a bang, we get that crit, and we can just move on. Mr. Mime is a little tanky, it can survive one body slam, and the double slap hitting several times is not ideal, but two shots isn't that bad, and now we can move on to the Venomoth. Now we've heard this before, people have talked about this a lot, but it's just so weird that Sabrina has a bug on her team. And just to make it even more funny, it's actually weak to psychic, so let's move on to the main course. This is where body slam comes in clutch. Sabrina's AI will only let her use recover, and if you can't 
can't do enough damage, it's going to infinitely stall the fight. You're not going to be able to do it. Now, remember when I said Body Slam needs to do over half health? It's because Recover heals for 50%. And this means that since we do more than 50%, we can outpace it. And we even get a crit on the second time to finish this one off clean. And now that the battle's over, I'm going to go on a little tangent here. But there are several runs that are like this where Body Slam and careful planning is the clear and definitive answer for Sabrina. But I can't tell you guys how many channels, big or small, just use extremely slow and painful methods like toxic on this fight. Alakazam, Gengar, Mewtwo, those are just three examples near the top of the tier list that can bring Body Slam into this fight and have these sorts of results, but I just, I can't understand the logic of Toxic. Now granted, I couldn't use Toxic anyway because it's banned under my rule set, but it just seems like a really strange conclusion to come to, but at the end of the day, people can do their runs however they want and it doesn't really affect me, but it's such a bad and painful thing to watch. I can't help but think about it. Now it's time to take on the final gym, and now at the very end of the game, we can finally say goodbye to confusion. I can't stress enough how good this move was to supplement Mewtwo's run, but Blizzard, we need it on the learn set to take us into the final home stretch. I learn it here for one simple reason, but as far as the start goes for Giovanni, Psychic does just fine. There's no need to overthink it, just go for your strongest move. I have the speed, I have the damage, we're blasting through everything, and when we finally make it to the end, I do have to use Blizzard's super effective damage to guarantee a one shot on the Rhydon, because there is a chance Psychic will fall short and we'll waste some turns, but that's the final badge, now we're on to bigger and better things. Quickly moving on to rival number six, there's really nothing here we haven't dealt with or we haven't seen before. Thunderbolt can handle the Pidgeot, Psychic's raw neutral damage can take out both the Rhyhorn and the Growlithe with ease, and we can just kind of warm up for the future Executor with a Blizzard on the Execute. Alakazam, it's not as much of a threat as Sabrina's was because it's not going to just spam recover and over and over, and we've already proven that we can handle that even if it was the case, and at the end of the day, we have Thunderbolt for Blastoise. This is a beefy little turtle, so once again, it can survive a hit and just like that we take it out and we're looking ahead to the Elite Four. Now my friends Mewtwo, it's getting close. You can see it's time, it's great, but this run it's not just to get Mewtwo up to its rightful spot where it belongs, but it's also to beat as many of those fancy new cross-gen runs as we can, so that means we need to get a move on and close the game out strong. Only being level 43 it presents another little pesky time loss, and that's the fact that we can still get wild encounters in Victory Road through the repel, since they are a higher level than us. So to remedy that, I'm going to be using all 10 of the rare candies I've picked up so far, and to save even more time, I'm going to be skipping the Victory Rogue Girl candy. This means that we're going to be level 53, we're going to have that nice damage rounding threshold here, and we can skip over Victory Road. And without further ado, I think it's time to look at the Elite Four and see how it goes. As we'll see going through the Elite Four, level 53 was the absolute lowest level that I was willing to go through the game at. Now I have some decent ranges, but I do miss the range on the Dugong, but we get this little funny interaction where it just uses takedown, and it just knocks itself out cold with the recoil, so that's pretty cool. Cloyster is next, it doesn't have great HP, it doesn't have great special, it's a one and done type of deal, and we're cruising. Thunderbolt, once again, as expected, is just shining through on the slow bro for an easy one shot, but it's worth pointing out that we are already approaching the Alola Nine tells time, but let's not focus on that right now. Jinx is next. I have to go for Body Slam, but I do hit the 25% crit roll. We keep things smooth. And at the very end of the fight, Lapras is bulky, but outside of maybe like a Blizzard Freeze, this one's, it's a done deal, even if it does take a couple of extra hits. And that's going to be the first leg of the race complete. Next, we have our old pal Bruno. And this is, I would say this is potentially the worst matchup ever for Bruno. The only thing I can really say about this fight is that I do swap to Thunderbolt so that I can take out the Hitmons just to save some Psychic PP. So that I can just like run through the next few battles just without healing or using elixirs but that's really about it and now for the cruelest joke in generation one we have Agatha so Game Freak they only gave Ghost the 20 base power lick for its damaging move and they accidentally made Psychic immune to Ghost even if they had a better one but on top of all that the little cherry on top is that they made all the Ghost in gen one part poison so that Psychic can just obliterate them into a thousand pieces now this fight it's just a Psychic showcase we're quickly moving on towards the end and let's go to the next one. 
Moving on to Lance, I want you to notice one thing. I still haven't healed. I still haven't used a single elixir. That's impressive in its own right, but I still have all my blizzards. I have a couple of sidekicks, and I have more than enough thunderbolts to murder this Gyarados. To get around the lower accuracy of blizzard, I do the safe play here. You can just sidekick one shot the Dragonairs, and after that, I go back to thunderbolt for the Aerodactyl, and that means the only Pokemon I actually need to use blizzard on is Dragonite. And even in like the worst case scenario, I should have multiple attempts. But here here we just hit the first blizzard in Mewtwo looking really clean and we only have one battle left. Pidgeot is the familiar lead, and this time it's no exception. Thunderbolt is going to take it out for a very anticlimactic start to the final round. Next is Alakazam, and I can't stress this enough. If you learn anything from this video, this is why you take Body Slam. Stop using Toxic. The 25% chance to crit comes in clutch. We do one-shot it, but even without it, we've already seen that it's more than an efficient way to deal with it. I'm begging you guys. I, last thing, last time I'll say it. Stop using Toxic. Now the fight's going to relax a little bit. I can Blizzard the special weak on for a free win and the thick puppy Arcanine. It's the first Pokemon we've seen in a while that can actually survive a hit. Now it throws out an ember and even if it got like a burn it really wouldn't change the outcome of this one as we push through towards the end. Now we see Executor and this is another reason for the Blastoise team. This Pokemon alone and so many runs it, in this run specifically it forces our hand at Blizzard because it's really tanky very annoying. Now I crit here but it really didn't matter. Let's move on. And the final question on this exam is Blastoise and we do have the correct answer with Thunderbolt. It almost gets that one shot and we don't finish off the run with style by getting another crit so for its turn I'm really shocked here the computer didn't just turn on the cheats go for the freeze proc and get it but it doesn't and it's pretty much low enough at this point where I could just throw a little potion bottle at it to finish it off if I wanted to but that's the run over. Mewtwo caps off its run with an end game time of 1 hour, 55 minutes, and 29 seconds with zero resets. And remember, I have a formula that I plug these numbers into to get a letter grade from 0 to 100. If you want to go into the numbers, you want to know more about that, it is in the description. But Mewtwo's final letter grade for my Generation 1 tier list is a score of 103.6 out of 100. Mewtwo is he's off the charts, even when ran through a mathematical formula. There's two things I would like to say real quick, and the first is that this took 39 minutes in 13 seconds of real time on times three speed and I just want to point out that when a channel like Scott has the times that are in the sub 40 on times four speed mind you they are like the elite of the elite runs and Mewtwo accomplished that on a lower speed setting so what I'm saying is that years from now when Scott finally gets to Mewtwo it's going to be absurdly fast way faster than you think it's going to be now come back to my tier list the only one that matters to me Alakazam he was the leader for the longest time with a 99.02 rating and Mewtwo YouTube just cleared its time by 13 minutes. And keep in mind that Alakazam was decently far ahead of the next place anyway. So there's no question here that Mewtwo sits atop of the Gen 1 tier list. But I'm pretty sure everybody kind of knew that it was going to be here at the end of the day. But what makes this one even better and even cooler to look into is that it's emphatically better than every cross-gen run that I've done outside of the absolutely busted Alolan Raichu and Alolan Ninetales run. But I just I still think it's bonkers that it came within a few minutes of Raichu despite the slow leveling group. And it still clears runs like Groudon by several minutes. It, so pretty impressive. So when we do cross-gen runs from now on, put some respect on Mewtwo's name because it's kind of setting the bar that these runs need to actually beat. And for the people that are always in the comments that don't think that new Pokemon should get new moves, think about a run like Iron Thorns had a ton of new moves. It only scored an 89 on the cross-gen tier list when stacked up against Mewtwo and it was about 20 minutes behind. Or what about the people who say the power creep and moves like Torch Song are busted and no one would ever beat the Skeledurge run. Look where it got him significantly lower than Mewtwo, that's where. Overall, Mewtwo, it's Gen 1 peak overpowered. You're staring at it. This is what a man looks like in Gen 1. But starting in Gen 2, it's not going to have Psychic on its starting learn set. Dark and Steel types are a thing. Ghost damage was fixed. They got things like Shadow Ball as well. So it's kind of just like downhill from here for Mewtwo. But it's still a powerhouse to this day. It's just not on another planet like it is in Gen 1. The last thing I'd like to say is special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I do appreciate the support. And if you made it this far 
part of the video, you're a real one, and you should comment that down below because it's probably my favorite comment to see. Keep in mind that this is the first video that I fully recorded and edited since June, so I'm kind of back with a fresh mindset and hopefully I can keep improving, we can kind of maintain that positive attitude. But you guys, you help a lot in that regard, so can't thank you enough, appreciate you. Now I'll catch you in the next video. Now I've told myself in the past that I'm gonna stick to just the run at hand, not talk about future videos because it's weird if plans start to change, but I do believe that it's about time for that Pidgeot run that we did the blind run on stream. So we finally, I finally got around to optimizing it, so I think it's time to do the recording, but it is what it is. Hopefully we'll see that next week. And I guess I'll catch you guys on the next one. Bye.